All right, so what are those INF files for? Yeah, file services. What's that? File services? No. Aren't those drivers or something? They're close. They are half of a driver. They're an information file. What's that? Drivers and software? Uh, driver what? Drivers and software. Well, no, they're, what they are is they're the part that's not software. They're the information files or plain text files which contain information about where the sys files are that contain the binary files for a driver. So they're part of how a driver is used. They're the configuration files for a driver. Probably the way to say it. Um, you have, every driver has an inf file, which is just a plain text file that says the actual driver is over in something.sys, something.com, and it tells it what, files, what binary files to load to make the driver. There's two parts to every driver, inf file and then one or more binary files. And that's what those things are. Um, all right, so what are the drivers you can install by anybody? The no warnings. Is the drivers not from the internet? No. Well, I kind of took a guess because it's kind of vague because I kind of put like the plug and play, whatever driver. Because well, the plug and play, you don't even have to install. Yeah, you don't have to, but it's kind of like the drivers are already included. That's yeah, but that's said. not. But those you don't even have. Nobody even has to install them. They're already there. No, the answer is WHQL signed drivers. If you buy something that says on the box okay. "Designed for Windows 7," that means the driver's been signed by Microsoft and will be automatically accepted as good. If they're, uh, what about ones that are in the driver store? If they're in the driver store, um, I think that's fine too. Yeah, that's a fair thing. Those, the administrator can improve them and put them in the driver store, and then they can be installed by anyone with no warnings. That seems like a good answer. Yeah. All right. Um, so, how many partitions can you make on a basic disk? Four. Four. Four is the normal. Now, if it was a GUID disk, you could put on it some huge number, but it's normally it's four. Yeah. I gotta put three primary and one extended. Is that that's fine? right. That's a better answer. That's a more perfect answer. There's four, and that's specifically the four you can do. Three primary and one more could be primary or extended. That's it. All right. So what's a VHD? I mean, a virtual hard disk. That's what it is. It's a file which can use the virtual hard disk, and in Windows you can you can map it as a disk and just use it. You can boot from it or you can uh, put a virtual machine on it. Windows treats virtual hard disk the same as real hard disk, which is one advantage over VMware. VMware does not. So if you, my students do this a lot, they open a virtual machine, they accidentally save their homework inside the virtual machine, and then they can't find it from the host, and the only way to get it is to start the virtual machine and get it, but if it was a Microsoft VHD, they could just open the virtual drive and pull it right off, which is kind of cool. All right, and so what's a journaling file system? Track of the keep, keep track of what? So keep track of the files that you install and recently updated or something like that. Yeah, that's close. What about you? Uh, keep track of file changes? Yes, it keeps track of the actions it does on the disk. It keeps track of every step. So I'm writing a block to the disk, I'm writing block number 40 to the disk, I'm writing block number 50 to the disk, and bam, I die. So when I wake up, I remember the next thing to do is write block 51. So I don't need to, like Windows 98, say, now you have to wait 10 minutes while I do check disk because I forgot what I was doing and left a bunch of junk on the disk. That's a journal. The journal is that record of every little step it takes. All right. Any questions about this? Well, let's talk about the new stuff. Now, there's just a little bit left of your book. Um, pen touch and voice input. Um, Windows 7 supports speech recognition, which is kind of amusing. There's a hilarious YouTube video when Vista came out with speech recognition of some guy trying to write like a, a program in C or Perl with speech recognition. And of course, it can't understand the computer terms. It keeps turning them into English. And it's just frustrating and maddening. Um, but it is included. It's just not very good. One, one of the many things that's wrong with it is um, you need a really good high quality microphone and a quiet room for a Microsoft product to work. But that is just the limitation of the Microsoft product. Ever since Windows 98, there's been a product you could buy for handicapped people called uh, Dragon Naturally Speaking. And it's wonderful. You can just get a cheap microphone and it can totally understand you. So it can be done. But the one Microsoft includes is pretty limited. Anyway, um, pen and touch features, this is, you know, Microsoft about five years ago started trying to push these so-called tablets. Before there were iPads, there were Microsoft tablets that were about an inch thick and weighed about six pounds. And when you could write in it with a pen. I don't know if anybody actually has these. It's like you took a laptop and took the lid off or bent it around to the bottom. But the old clunky heavy laptop, there's a lot of people carrying these things around. Um, I don't, they were popular for some business sectors for a while, but I don't think anybody really wants to carry those around anymore. Now you get ultra books and tablets and stuff. Anyway, that's the tablet PC. Notice how thick that thing is. Um, this is before the iPad. Microsoft had it first and they can wind it, but they didn't really have this cool miniaturized product. But you could write on this thing and it would turn it into text to some extent. Just like speech recognition, it was a somewhat iffy process. Um, 
then you have touch stable PCs and you have these ones that can rotate around. Um, this form factor never got very popular, I think, where you'd have a normal laptop and you turn the thing around backwards. Those, I think people did, this wasn't a hit. What became a hit, of course, is like the Surface or the iPad, where you get either a Bluetooth or a snap-in keyboard, like the Surface. That's what become a hit, because it's much more compact. Yeah? Isn't that because those were really bulky? Yeah. They're heavy, and I don't think the battery lasts very long. You know, they're, these, these were the first attempt to have real portable computing, and it, it was kind of bad like netbooks. I love netbooks, but they really only had a lifetime of about two years before they stopped being cool, because the iPad pretty much killed them. The iPad is so much nicer, so much lighter, the battery lasts longer. So kind of wipe these out. Yeah, any question over there? Oh, I guess not. All right. Anyway, um, but that was the convertible one. And so if you have one of those things, your computer will show um, more inputs, like pen and touch, whether you can write with a pen, or whether you're touch screen capable. Mine wasn't, of course. Um, but you'll, you can also have multi-touch and gestures, and that's a big hit. You know, we, the iPhone is where it all, people have it best. You can just zoom in to make the text bigger. And on some Microsoft products, you can also zoom in. Um, you can also reorient your desktop. By the way, this will probably work on mine. Let's see. I think the look was all up. Control all up. Might not work on this one. Let's see. This is a kind of a cute trick, and it's funny you can do it in the lab if you hate people. Um, like the stunt where you, you take away the desktop icons. Now, let me see if I can find it in the GUI here. It's screen resolution. Okay. Um, right click. Green resolution, and there should be an orient area, orientation. There you are. Do stuff like this. <laughs> and now it's kind of hard to control your machine. <laughs> um, you can turn it upside down. And the point of that is with this kind of monitor here, you can hang it upside down or you put it on the side. You can make a grid of three by three of them to make a whole wall of stuff for like advertising. And then you need these adjustments. Oh, good. I really appreciate the thing where after 15 seconds it goes back because I couldn't figure out how to use my mouse now. There's a video game like that. They move your mouse controls so left by 90 degrees, and man, it's really hard to adapt to that. Anyway, um, so that's, that's the orientation thing. And it's important with these flat panel displays that are so light that you really can hang them upside down from your shelf and all that jazz. Um, you have multi-touch and gestures. Microsoft has them. The, the king of this is their service product. that's as big as this table where you just sit and it has water and you ripple and you can play music and move photographs around. But the thing cost about $10,000 and it became mostly a curiosity of trade shows. I don't think they sold too many of them. Um, and you have touch keyboard, you can write with a pen on your pen touch, and uh, you can type in your machine like a cell phone. These are all Microsoft's early attempts to go for what they really got into in Windows 8, where they really try to make it like you're on a cell phone even when you're not, which is a highly questionable decision, and I'm certainly hoping they will find another version of Windows 9, where they actually admit that you need a different input for this kind of machine than you do for a tablet. And stop trying to pretend that we're going to use them both the same way. But anyway, um, there's, you have speech recognition is here. You have to read like a page of text from Microsoft Windows 7 to learn your voice. And even then, it's not terribly accurate if you use like a $10 cheap microphone, which I tried um, in a normal noisy room. One thing is funny is Pierre Theory is here, and he's got, he's Belgian, and he's got kind of the thick accent. And he said he couldn't get this thing to work at all. And then the TV news came on. His wife's watching it and printed out all the news, because they had the voice they wanted to hear, and they had the standard American voice. And him with a French accent, he couldn't understand the thing he said. Anyway, um, all right, and that's the game. So uh, the other stuff here is not in your book, and it will not be on the final exam, but it is on the Microsoft Windows 7 cert test. Now, I'm, uh, by the way, next semester, you ought to take PowerShell. There's going to be a class in PowerShell here next semester, 102. And it's, it looks like it's almost full, but it would definitely that recommend now? you take What's that? Is that definite now? That's yes, they hired the guy I wanted, and he's going to teach PowerShell. I was going to give him this class, but they put them both at the same time, so he can't do that. So I don't know what's going to become of this class next semester. But, but anyway, what's, what's that? The time the power show. What is it? What time is it? Uh, Thursday night, I think. Thursday night. Yeah. And um, so it's 102. I recommend it um, for you guys. The PowerShell is awesome, and I don't plan to teach PowerShell here. I used to teach a little brief lesson in it, but I think it's more important to cover this. Um, but anyway, I had some students take this class. See, I got certified in Windows XP, and I got certified in Server 2000 and in Vista. But I never got certified in Windows 7. I felt kind of bad about that, but there's all these security things I was getting into that seemed more important. And so then some students took this class, right, took the same book, and they said, you couldn't pass the cert test. And I felt bad. There's stuff on the test that's not in your book, which I should have caught, but I'm kind of losing interest in Windows. That's why I'm trying to dump this class. I give it to Doug. Doug is a Windows expert. I am moving over in the world of security. And as you can imagine, the more you get into security, the less you like Microsoft. So um, anyway. Uh, 
So here's the, the stuff I added to make up for that from this supplementary book here, which is um, the Microsoft Training Kit. I went through a couple chapters of this to add the big things that are missing from the test. So um, that's the point here. This is stuff we have somewhat covered before, but it's covered a little differently in this book. Um, and then the next couple of classes, I'll talk more about these Microsoft deployment tools, which I went and took a class in. And there is a special certification just in Microsoft Windows 7 deployment. And it is valuable. A lot of companies really do this. They really pay people to move all their 10,000 machines from XP to Windows 7. Now, nobody is using Windows 8 at all in the corporate world. They're just laughing at it, um, just like Vista. But I'm sure they're going to move to Windows 9. And these deployment tools really work and really become standard, so it's worth knowing. And it's, you've got to learn them, too, because even ordinary tasks, like installing a new OS on a laptop you buy, now requires these deployment tools. I was unable to put Windows 2012 on a Windows 8 laptop until I use the real deployment tools, and that's going to be the standard from now on. So you've got to begin getting used to this new complex world. And what these tools are, are tools that were developed by Microsoft for their OEM partners like Dell, for Dell to use to make all the machines they're going to sell. And they were never really intended for public consumption, but they gradually got a little more and more polished, and then they started letting more people have them. And then they're slowly becoming more mainstream. But it's not something an end home user or a small tech support company would ever use. It's something a corporation would use, somebody with hundreds and thousands of machines that has to put them out. And uh, it's really worth doing. Although I'm surprised because that, that, that area was owned by, by Norton Ghost. And a lot of companies still use Ghost, but, it never, but more and more of them are switching over to the Microsoft product. So if you know this, there are people looking specifically for people with this skill. Anyway, so the main thing is, um, knowing what you do in Windows 7, which you hopefully already know most of this stuff. So there are six Windows editions, but some of them are not used in America, like Home Basic and Enterprise. It's only used by the largest corporations. You can't buy it. It's the same thing as Ultimate, but it um, comes with a volume license. And uh, all right. So unfortunately, Microsoft went back and forth on what the heck Starter was and Home Basic was. Originally, Starter was going to be for the developing world, Home Basic for America, and then they changed their mind and reversed it. So some Microsoft documents say one thing and some say the other. Uh, there's often inconsistency in the Microsoft documents because they put out stuff and then they change it and they don't clean up the old websites. Anyway, um, Home Basic is the one that's not in America. Starter is the one that was put on the netbooks in America. So only one processor can't play DVDs. Your background is permanently stuck to some logo and you can't get rid of it. Um, you can join home groups, but you can't create one. You don't even have Windows Media Center. Pretty irritating. So almost everybody would upgrade to home premium. Home Basic was the one uh, only in other countries. Um, very limited. Pretty much like Starter. Um, so 32-bit versions will support 32 cores and 64 will support 256 cores, which is plenty, you would think. I mean, the only thing anybody can afford now is like a four core, maybe six or eight, I guess, on the really high-end ultra books. Um, but the processors do exist with more cores. I saw a video a year and a half ago of a cell phone with 80 cores in the processor. I bet the battery doesn't last long, but it was doing like 3D vector rotations and stuff. Um, Intel makes these chips with a ton of cores. It's just not very many people have figured out how to get any good out of them yet. Um, anyway, so Home Premium has got a 4 gigs for 32, and that's always going to be true because that's about 2 to 32 is just 4 gigs. So 32 the processor is never going to be able to really properly address any more than 30 than 4 gigs of RAM, but 16 gigs for 64 bit. And that is not that much, you know. I know people have 8 gigs, and it would be unthinkable to have 16 gigs, but if you did, you'd want a better operating system than Home Premium. Um, the main thing you notice is you can't join a domain, you can't control your remote desktop, it's missing all the business features. It's intended for a home user. The Pro is the one almost everybody wants at work. Um, by the way, uh, let me just mention DreamSpark is back. Microsoft fixed our DreamSpark account, and DreamSpark now. I do not know why they did this, but now you can get the enterprise version of Windows 8.1. We never could give it away before, but Windows 8.1 has professional and it also has enterprise. At least it did, you know, I looked at it before. Maybe I didn't put the link here, but it's available. Um, if I go to, let's do Windows 8, 8.1. We do have the enterprise now for free. We never had it before, so that's kind of cool. I was kind of frustrated teaching this course for a while. Windows XP and Windows 7 and Vista, we never had the ultimate version, so I always had to have some kind of nonsense to work around to give students any projects that use the ultimate features. And now they finally gave us the enterprise version. I don't know why, but they did for Windows 8.1, so that's kind of cool. So be aware. And your accounts should all work. You should all be able to get your product keys and free software again. We, it took us a week or two to straighten it out with Microsoft, but we're back up. 
right, anyway, um, so uh, the Windows Pro gives you, of course, the ability to join a domain, encrypting file system. The only thing missing is um, you need to get Windows XP mode. The only thing missing is BitLocker and um, branch cache and direct access. Those are the main features you don't get without going all the way up to Ultimate. Um, but you can back up to networks. Oh, you don't get the language packs. I, I don't think Pro will let you install a multi-language version. Enterprise will let you install one image, which will work in China and Japan and India and America. Multi-language is all in the same thing. That's an Enterprise or Ultimate feature that you don't get with Pro. And so in Enterprise, it's the same thing as Ultimate. Um, you're always stuck with four gigs on 32-bit hardware, but nobody should be buying any 32-bit hardware except on portable devices anymore. I mean, it's a ridiculous amount of RAM for 64, of course. Language packs, bit locker, and boot for PhD. Remember I said before, you can take a virtual hard disk and you can even boot from it, but only if you put Enterprise or Ultimate on it, which is kind of annoying, but that's the way it is. And direct access is Microsoft's VPN. I haven't been able, I haven't played with it to see it work. Although now we've got domains and there are domain controllers, so we can check it out. But supposedly, you can just use your built-in Windows to just connect with a virtual private network to your domain from anywhere without having to install a client at either end. You don't have to pay for Cisco VPN concentrator. You just you, you turn on branch uh, direct access and you do the miracle of IP version 6. You can connect from anywhere to your home office with the virtual private network. But I don't know any details and I haven't written a project using it because it only works if you have a Windows domain at the other end. And um, I figure I'd leave it to the later classes, the server classes. But um, it does sound pretty good. I wouldn't be surprised if, like most Microsoft products, you will find that it's not really as good as if you pay for Cisco VPNs. That's typically what all this stuff is. The stuff included free in Windows is kind of a stripped down, bare bones, limited version. And if you pay for specialized stuff, you usually get something better. But still, it's, it's pretty cool that it's there at all. And it might meet some use cases. So you need at least 5 12 gigs of RAM for starter, but any other version you need a gig. And a lot of people say 2 gigs for 64 bits. So you have to have something that has the installation files to install Windows. We've been using DVDs. You can also put that on a USB. Now, you cannot run Windows 7 from a USB. You can't boot from USB and run Windows 7. You can install it, but you can't run it. The only version of Windows that supports that is Windows 8. Windows 8, they will sell you a USB drive for like 300 bucks because it's a full Windows 8 and run it right from USB. All the Microsoft insiders are carrying these around tech debt showing them off. That's a real step forward for Microsoft. Linux people have been doing that for years, but have never been able to figure out how to do it with Windows, Windows XP or anything. It's, somehow it doesn't work to boot right from USB, but they finally got that working in Windows 8. Um, you can install from a network share. This has always been the case, right back to XP. You just put all the files on the share and install them all over your network, which is fine. And now, if you have Windows Deployment Service, if you're in a domain, this is the tool you use to push out image Windows images. And you put the install.win file, which is a Windows image file, on the server, and you run this Windows Deployment Service, and you can now push out over, the, over your, your corporate network, you can push out images. This is replacing Microsoft uh, Windows XP had something called RDS, Remote Deployment Service. And this is the next step up to that, Windows Deployment Service. Um, all right. By the way, the target has to boot something, so the target will boot a uh, Windows Discover image, which you make on a USB drive or a, a CD, or you can you set it up to use PXE, which is much better. PXE is pre-execution environment. You press F12, get in the BIOS, and you boot from the network. So it completely ignores the hard drive. It goes over the network and gets a little starter, and that boots up a system that goes over the network and puts the OS on there. I know some colleges that have set this up, with Windows, the, with the previous product, uh, remote desk, um, remote deployment services in XP, and it really is nice. You have a lab full of students using machines, and if one of them is messed up, all you do is boot up, press F12, boot from network, and it will just reinstall the entire OS clean over the network. So in 20 minutes, it's back to normal. Here we have Deep Freeze, which accomplishes the same thing in a simpler way, but it's a cool thing to deploy the OS that way. But that particular product, Windows Deployment Service, only works on the domain. This is a weird thing about Microsoft. They made two completely different tools that do the same job by completely different teams, and they work completely differently. WDS is the enterprise class domain deployment tool, and the other one is Wake, Windows Automated Installation Kit, for the non-domains. Anyway, so you can install a standard one. Uh, and it's going to open a Windows and ask the user for things like, what is your password, what are your network settings? or unattended installation. You can bring in an unattend.xml file, which will contain all those answers, and then you don't have to wait. This has been the way it's been since XP. Um, you can install these to VHD, Enterprise, or Ultimate. By the way, this is a pretty pedantic statement. You can install other versions to VHD, but they won't boot. Well, 
Why would you even call that install? This is like there's an entertaining statement. You can go from a dynamic disk back down to a basic disk. You can convert. The conversion works like this. You destroy all the data, convert the disk, and then put all the data back. Well, I wouldn't really call that a convert. Anyway, um, so that's the game. Uh, I have a few eye clickers about that stuff. Come grab one if you need one. But starters used. Starters what you get is by network. No, the one they never sold here was home base. Oh. And that confused the people inside Microsoft also. Uh, I, I think I mentioned before, in Vista, Microsoft actually got sued and their own product manager in court could not explain what the difference was between Vista Home Basic and Vista Home Premium. And they said they were actually, you know, punished for confusing, frustrating, and betraying the customers by promising one thing and then delivering home basic and didn't seem to be worth it. Anyway, um, all right, how many of these editions here can join a domain? Remember, this is a deal killer. For most companies, you can't join a domain. That machine is useless at our workplace. Basic idea. If you're at work, you should be in a domain. If you're not in a domain, you should be at home. Anyway. All right. Um, how many of these gives you remote desktop service? So you can remote control those machines. Hello. Oh, hi. <laughs> oh, you have a new, a new student. <laughs> um, this little fellow wants to know about Windows 7, obviously. The idea of Microsoft is you'll have your machine at work and you'll be at home and then you'll call up a remote control work machine to do something you forgot to do at work. Maybe you should redo that if the dog's not there was all Yeah, the dog, yeah, was yeah that was that was mission yeah. What about the dog? <laughs> I was confused. <laughs> 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 the dog had an eye clicker and therefore it's not in the running yet. So, all right. So how many of these can you run from the VHD? By the way, I'm not sure why you would want to do that, but Microsoft sure brags about it. They must think that this is great. I bet some of these are going to be shaking off somehow. All right, and that's two. Enterprise oh. monitors. You cannot do that with Pro. Get to, uh, so it's not in the projects, but <laughs> anyway. That's why it's nice they're finally giving us enterprise. We could get projects to show up these enterprise features in Windows 8.1. All right, well, we might as well take a break. You've been through a lesson. Let's pick up uh, right at 10. It gives you about 10 minutes.